How did you do that? Magic. <laughs> All right. Um, on behalf of Anne Marie Slaughter, our president, and Peter Bergen, the vice president and head of the International Security Program, welcome to New America uh, and our book event for David Wood, his new volume, What Have We Done? The Moral Injury of Our Longest Wars. Um, David needs uh, very little introduction to many of you. Um, I've been on the stage with David before. We talked about this project at an earlier stage, so yep. I look forward to hearing how your views have changed and matured, if at all, um, as you work through the book project. Um, but uh, David is a longtime reporter, um, has worked for a number of serious venues, um, currently with Huffington, Huffington Post. Post. Yep. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm just going to let uh, David talk about his book. Um, then we'll have a, I'll engage David in a conversation, and then we'll turn to our audience here. Okay, and that's really the most important part because I want to hear from you folks, and I want to be challenged and um, um, and and have the opportunity to ans answer tough questions. So be thinking while I'm talking. So I want to I want to read some from the book because it's really good, and I like reading. <laughs> But also because um, my sense is that most of us don't really know what veterans went through when they deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan over the last 15 years or so, which is the subject of this book. Um, I went uh, to the Pentagon the other day and looked up to see how many people actually did deploy, and it's 2.3 million, the Pentagon says, which, I, you know, take it with a grain of salt because sometimes they count people who deployed three or four times as three or four people, and sometimes they count them as one person. So, But about, about 2.8 million. And if my math is right, that works out to about one-ninth of one percent of the American population. So uh, to my point, we don't really know veterans, and more important, we don't understand the kinds of things they went through. So what I document in this book is some of what they went through, which I have learned to recognize as moral injury. And moral injury, very simply, is a violation of our sense of what's right. And I borrowed that phrase from Jonathan Shea, who was a longtime uh, VA psychiatrist and worked uh, for many, many years with Vietnam veterans and came to recognize that what they had mostly was not PTSD, but something else, and he called it moral injury. So thank you, Jonathan Shea. Um, so we all walk around with a sense of what's right, which we get from our parents, we, you know, kids on the street, school, church, synagogue, mosque. Um, and then when you um, get into the military, you get a whole nother set of moral values, if you will. Or I think there's like nine army values and there's a whole bunch of Marine Corps values. And these are these are the things that recruits have to shout while they're doing push-ups. You know, that's how they learn. But the interesting thing is that I've seen over many, many years of uh, living with these folks is that those values are woven into their daily life in a really kind of serious way. So this is the best of what our culture has. These values are our highest ideals, and they're really, really um, impressive, and people in the military act on them every day. The problem comes when they go to war, because in war, things happen all the time that violate your sense of what's right, as I'm sure you can imagine. So here's an example that I've written about in this book. Um, I, a young Marine named Nick uh, Rudolph, uh, in a firefight in Afghanistan, um, the Marines are assaulting a farm compound uh, in, outside of Marja. This was, I think, in 2010. And at one point, he sees somebody coming around from the corner of a building shooting at him and his Marines with an automatic rifle, semi-automatic rifle. And he gets that person in his sights and realizes that's a 10-year-old kid and shoots him dead. So it, in that specific circumstance, it was the tactically correct thing to do and the legally justifiable thing to do under anybody's definition. There were two combatants. They took each other under lethal fire, and, uh, and the, the kid died. Uh, you could even say it was a morally correct thing to do because Nick Rudolph is protecting himself and the people he loves most in the world, which are his fellow Marines. But he killed a child, you know, and by anybody's definition, that ain't right, as he would acknowledge. 
Uh, so that's a moral injury, and it happens in, in not quite so dramatic ways uh, over and over again in warfare, especially in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which were profoundly ambiguous and difficult, and nobody really knew what the point was, and, and it was just uh, a whole different, difficult exercise. Um, how I know all this is that, um, so I went to, I went to Afghanistan with Nick Rudolph's battalion, the 1st Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment, um, or 1-6 as they say, and specifically with Charlie Company, and I trained with them at Camp Lejeune, and then we all went to Afghanistan and uh, spent a couple months there. And then after everybody came home and after they got out of the, most of these guys got out of the Marine Corps, I looked them up and, and um, got in touch with them because so many difficult and interesting and important things that happened, but you never have time uh, when you're deployed to really think about them. You're, in my experience at least, you're too tired or you're too angry or you're too depressed or you're too scared or you're too bored or you're too lonely or too homesick. <laughs> All those things kind of crowd in and you're just like, things go by and things happen and you don't think about them. In fact, I asked Nick Rudolph one time, so after you killed that child or kid, what happened? What what did you do? And he said, "Well, we policed up the weapon and kept on going. You know, they were chasing the Taliban out the back of this farm compound and left the kid lying in the kid's body lying in the dust." I mean, it's that kind of thing. You know, a huge event in Nick Rudolph's life, just you know, without time to really sit down. And there was no kumbaya session after that. I think he went and talked to the chaplain, and the chaplain said, you know, basically, shit happens. Um, and, and so that was, that was pretty much that. Um, so again, a lot of the, or some of the stories in this book came out of sessions that I had with these Marines, or guys who had gotten out of the Marine Corps recently. And uh, I'd rent a couple of hotel rooms somewhere and, and get many cases of beer and set the beer out, and they'd, we'd all drink, and they'd talk, and my tape recorder would run. So that's, that's where one of many of these stories came from. So I'm going to read from, um, as it turns out, chapter 7, uh, which is about in the middle of the book. And it's called, Grief is a Combat Injury. On a routine combat patrol outside of Marja in January 2010, a squad of Marines from 2nd Platoon, Charlie Company, one six, crept cautiously toward an adobe compound in a farm village, hunting a Taliban gang who were making and planting IEDs, the deadly bombs responsible for the majority of American dead and wounded. At the head of the patrol was Lance Corporal Zachary Smith, Smitty. He was 19 years old, taller than his dad, a New York State trooper, but with his dad's engaging grin. Growing up in small town Hornell, New York, he'd been deeply affected by the terror attacks on 9-11. When he was in the sixth grade, he'd glued an image of Osama bin Laden on a cardboard box and took pot shots at it with his grandfather's 22 caliber rifle. Before he left Camp Lejeune with 1-6 that November, Smitty had gone home and married his high school sweetheart, Anne. Now he was barely a month into his first combat experience. As he stepped carefully, an IED suddenly erupted beneath him, tearing off his legs and scything down other Marines with shrapnel and blast wounds. Corporal Zachary Auclair rushed to save him, kneeling and frantically pulling out tourniquets and bandages, and Auclair was soon bathed in Smitty's blood. Watch for the second one, watch for the second one. The Taliban often laid IED traps in pairs of bombs, and the senior leader on the patrol, 28-year-old platoon sergeant Daniel Angus was frantically warning his Marines, and then he himself stepped on the second IED. The blast blew him apart, killing him instantly, and spraying Eau Claire with blood and viscera. <clears throat> in the chaos, Staff Sergeant Warren Repture, wounded in the face by shrapnel, was on the radio calling for a medevac bird, and Smitty lay dying in Eau Claire's arms. It is difficult to imagine the emotional shock and grief that slammed into the Marines of Charlie 16. 6 
of course they realized they were at war, and as they knew, as they often said, bad shit happens. So the emotional shock didn't come from surprise as much as from the catastrophic loss of deeply loved comrades, <clears throat> obliterated in an instant of horror, seared forever into the souls of the survivors. What lingers after the shock wears off is the deep emotional, the deep moral injury of grief, perhaps the most common psychological wound of the generation that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. The pain that these men and women carry is not only the most common emotion, but perhaps the most difficult to share with outsiders. The survivors often feel guilt for not having spotted the IED that killed their buddy, or for surviving when a buddy goes home in a body bag. Many veterans find it impossible to convey the depth of emotion that binds members of a small unit like Second Platoon, and why each combat death thus cuts so deep. Coming as together as they do, these emotions of grief, sorrow, shame, guilt, and loss endure as a powerful combat injury. In the bloody chaos of that awful day in Afghanistan, Angus was dead and Smitty was dying and his best friend, Xavier Zell, knew he should go over and grip Smitty's hand to give some comfort in his last moments, but Smitty was a bloody mess and Zell, who was 22, told himself he had to pull security, taking his place in the outward facing defense perimeter the Marines had set up, anticipating an attack and waiting frantically for the medevac chopper to come in. <coughs> Zell was torn, knowing he should go to his friend, but he was afraid. It was too much. He couldn't even look. Um, there's another Marine here I'm going to introduce named Darren Doss. He was one of the Marines of Charlie 1 6. Darren Doss had just come back from a patrol with his squad. From a distance, he'd heard the blast and seen the column of smoke, and he knew. In telling the story now, Doss spoke mechanically, his words dead. I saw the gunny and first sergeant zip them up in the body bags, he said. Angus, both his legs were gone and one arm was gone and the other was kind of fused in an awkward position. They put the bags on stretchers and went out to the helo single file and the helo took them away. And I went back to my tent and Al Claire was sitting there and there were like guts hanging off his helmet and blood all over his stuff. He was crying and he had baby wipes, but the baby wipes were all dried up, covered with blood. He was trying to clean under his fingernails and I sat down and I wanted to talk to him maybe try to cheer him up, but I didn't know what to say. I like gave him a, pair, a pack of baby wipes I'd gotten in the mail and I went outside and just, that was about it. <clears throat> As the, so again, the Marines were telling me these stories. We're sitting in a hotel room in Philadelphia having drank oh, quite a bit of beer and, um, and the stories were rolling out. And as the story of Smitty and Angus was still reverberating, someone started telling the one about the tent stakes. Adjacent to the Marines outpost there in Marja was an encampment of Afghan National Army soldiers who lived in a US military tent that was pegged to the desert floor with huge wooden stakes. Across the way, the Marines would build a fire at night, and since wood was scarce, they began eyeing those tent stakes. Doss. Every night we'd go over to the ANA tent and sneak off with a couple of their stakes and use them for the fire, but we were careful only to take one at a time. One night a transport helo came in with water resupply, landing in a hurricane blast of dirt and pebbles, and the Marines took cover. When we went out to get the water, Doss said, we look across the dirt and like, the Afghan army tent is 100% gone. All their cots are sitting in a row, but the tent itself is gone because we burned every one of the stakes. We were all helpless with laughter at this. They had no idea what happened, Doss said, recovering and wiping tears from his eyes. They were standing around like fucking baffled. Then there was the Christmas tree caper. At their base in Marja, the Marines had stacked their empty Connex boxes three high, and that December, the battalion chaplain had a couple of Marines erect a decorated Christmas tree on top of the Connex boxes. Connex boxes are like the size of a tractor trailer. Trailer, they're big steel shipping containers. 
One day, one of the platoon sergeants said to the Charlie 1-6 Marines, hey, I got a mission for you guys. See that Christmas tree? After chow, I want that Christmas tree in our tent. Get the Christmas spirit. So that night, said Doss, <coughs> we all dressed in black fucking climb up there and cut the rope securing the tree and we make it down to like the first Connex box and all of a sudden, hey, what are you doing? No matter how many times the Marines have told and retold this story, they're laughing and shouting over one another trying to tell it again. Nick Rudolph take, took over telling the story. We get caught and we're up there and some of the guys book it out of there and we're like fucked. And the chaplain comes and he's like, I want your fucking name and rank and who you're with. And I'm like, I'm second platoon. And he goes, what's your name? And I'm like, Rudolph, sir. And the chaplain is beat red with rage, bellowing up at Rudolph. And he's like, you're trying to tell me your name is Rudolph? And you're stealing my Christmas tree on Christmas? I don't fucking believe it. <laughs> they put the tent tree back up, but they hopped down the other side of the Connex boxes and escaped punishment. But oh man, Rudolph said, chuckling and shaking his head. So around that time, there was an Afghan kid who used to come around the Marines outpost, basking in their attention. One day, this boy kept trying to get them to go outside, wanting to show them something. Doss and Stephen Canty, one of the other Marines, and some others finally went with him into a, an adjacent field toward a tree line. And there they discovered a desiccated corpse, a man the Marines had shot a while back. Stephen Canty remembered the shooting. The man had been acting suspiciously and wouldn't respond to the warning shots the Marines had fired in accordance with their rules of engagement. And so he was shot and killed. Now his body had been ravaged by dogs. It turns out that the corpse was the boy's father, who was deaf and mute and couldn't hear or respond to warning shots, the boy explained. And that's why he appeared to ignore the Marines and why he was shot and killed and was now lying dead in a field. I'm not sure how that feels, Steve Candy said when I asked him how he'd reacted to that awful news. Here we are trying to do our American ideals all over the place, he said, and we're being arrogant cowboys. In the accumulation of such horrifying events, he said, our morality did wear down. But Doss took it harder. The killing and the realization of how it had taken place created a grief that seemed to penetrate deep into his soul. Few knew it at the time, but his own father was in poor health, in and out of hospitals with an autoimmune condition, among other problems, and his father had had surgery and a pacemaker implanted in his chest. He'd been sick since Doss was in the sixth grade. He would joke to Darren and his two sisters that his pacemaker would sometimes shock the shit out of me, and the kids would laugh, but they realized this meant his heart was stopping. <coughs> Michael Doss died in 2012, two years after Darren came home from Afghanistan. After his father's funeral and a burial at the Niskayuna Refined Church just outside of Schenectady, New York, Darren began to have nightmares, exploding awake in horror. He spoke about it in the videotaped interviews that Stephen Canty has done with members of Charlie One Six. And we watched the interview in a hotel room one afternoon as a dozen Marines and I were sprawled across beds uh, littered with uh, beer cans, I might say. Doss wasn't there, he'd gone, he'd gone home a couple of hours earlier. So in this video, Doss is saying that in his nightmare, he's back in Afghanistan, going out into that field with Canty and the Afghan boy, and they find the corpse, but instead of the Afghan man who'd been dead for days, it's his father and his father's face is partly eaten away. And on the videotape, Doss breaks down in great gulping sobs of anguish, but he manages to finish eaten away by dogs, and he slides down out of the camera's view, and the sound of sobbing slowly fades. In our hotel room, there's dead silence for a long moments, and then someone says, I love you, Doss. So, that's what I have to read. Uh, so we know now that moral injury is real, that it's painful, and that at least in my experience, it affects everybody who goes to war. These experiences I've just been talking about are not uncommon. <coughs> so now what? So I have a friend who's a psychiatric nurse at the VA, and she wrote me recently and said this. 
The truth of combat is all around us. So we better start listening to the truth about what happens to our sons and daughters in war. So I thought about that for a long time when I was writing this book, and I thought, that's really it. We need to, we need to listen to their stories. Seems to me we're sort of at an inflection point, or I don't know, a hinge of history, or some, something like that, where we could go one of two ways, and I'm thinking about the Vietnam veterans, uh, and I don't want to go that way. So the Vietnam generation of war fighters came home and to a, a pretty hostile environment, and I don't want to pick sides here, but understandably they were afraid to talk about what happened um, and how they felt about it, and everybody else was too angry or too afraid to ask them, and so they never did talk about their experiences. And so I know Vietnam veterans, I think most of them just stuffed that, those experiences down and covered it with, um, uh, by being a workaholic or self-medicating or um, in one instance, and I guess this is pretty common, I know a Vietnam combat veteran who walks the perimeter every night in his house before he can go to sleep. And he's out there as he was a young Marine Lieutenant out on the perimeter checking all his guys. He got ammunition. The Claymore mines are set in the right place. Radio's working. You all, you know, wide awake. Um, you've got ponchos when it rains and, and taking care of your trench foot and on and on, all these kind of details that have to be taken care of at war. And now he can't go to sleep until he does the same thing. And I don't know exactly how, how this works when he's walking around his house, but he, as he explained it to me, I'm checking the perimeter. So there are those kinds of maladoptions to moral injury that um, really characterize the Vietnam generation. And to our shame, we let this all happen. And part of what happened, I think, was that the, that the mental health community finally woke up and realized, you know, there's some bad stuff going on here, and we better get on it. And it took them a long time, but finally in 1980 or maybe 1981, they came out with, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And the way they defined it was, you had to have an experience in which you were terrified that you were just about to lose your life. A and this came out of uh, their work with car crash victims. So people who'd been in a car wreck um, developed PTSD and the, the um, the involuntary reactions to that remembering that terrifying incident. So that's, that's PTSD. It's almost a mechanical, physical process. Um, and they went on to uh, not just define this diagnosis, but to encourage the VA to come up with um, a lot of uh, therapies. So m many of the therapies that the VA came up with were based on the ex theory of extinction, and that is where you, you've had some terrifying experience and so you tell it over and over and over again. You know, I was in a car crash, you tell it again. I was in a car crash, you tell it again. And eventually it sort of loses its emotional power, right? That's extinction therapy. So a fair number of veterans went to the VA for help and got diagnosed with PTSD and put in some of these uh, therapy sessions with um, extinction therapy. and. After a while, almost all have dropped out. And if you look at the studies that have been done on the effectiveness of the PTSD diagnosis and the therapies that followed, um, you can see that if you went through the whole VA program of PTSD or you did nothing, just stayed home, your, your result would be about the same. Almost no, no recovery whatsoever. And so it's been a gigantic failure, which is one of the things that really surprised me when I started looking into this, is that, um, is that the response to the Vietnam veterans absolutely didn't work. So, so what's happened since then <coughs> is that the American Psychiatric Association, which designs the official diagnosis by which doctors, which doctors use, um, they've been watering down the definition of PTSD so that now I think you don't have to actually have a terrifying experience. You could hear about someone else having a terrifying experience and that could give you PTSD. Well, and the way I read their rules, you could even be like a 
you know, a 10 year old kid watching a cowboy movie and, you know, and get PTSD from that. So I, I think it's, you know, my sense is that the community of mental health people are sort of floundering, floundering around to figure out uh, what PTSD is, and a lot of them had said to me, look, basically, we don't understand trauma. On the other side of the ledger, there is some encouraging work going on um, with defining moral injury and trying to figure out ways to help people who are suffering from moral injury. Now, I should say that, like any injury, there's a whole spectrum of seriousness here, right? So, as with a physical injury, you know, hangnail all the way to, you know, quadruple amputation or brain cancer or something. Um, and, and so with moral injury, my, my sense is that there are people who experience something that violated their sense of what's right, but, you know, they sort of moved on and never really thought much about it, and that's fine. And then on the other end of the scale, there are people who have had an experience that drives them to their knees and they don't recover. So, or they feel that it has such an impact on their life, on their life that something's got to be done. And so, when I was talking to these Marines, and in particular when I was hearing Nick Rudolph's story about killing the, the child, as he thinks of it. When he finished that story, there was a long silence, and I was, I was about to say something like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. I, I wanted to comfort him. I wanted to say, you know, don't worry about it. It was war. Bad things happen in war. Or, you know, it was him or you, and I'm glad it was him that got killed, not you, and all those kind of weasel explanations we had. But, and, and while I was trying to think, you know, what, what, what do you say to someone who's killed a child? One of the Marines said something that later on, listening to my tape, I thought, this is perfect. It's the perfect answer. And what that Marine said, and I don't remember who it was, he said, yeah, that was fucked up. And I thought, what a perfect response. That was fucked up. Because, you know, it's, it's a discrete event that happened in the past. That was fucked up. Not that is fucked up. It was, and it's over. And there's no blame attached. There's, it, it's not like you fucked up. It's just that was fucked up. It's, it's just a beautiful phrase. But the most important thing which I got thinking about that session where we were sitting around talking is it didn't affect their relationship with Nick. It's not like, oh, dude, you know, you fucked up. It was like, we're still here, we're buddies, we love you, and we accept you. And it sort of verges on the whole idea of forgiveness, which is something that I, I, I really have backed away from thinking about moral injury, because I don't know that there's anything to forgive. Some people feel as if they've done something that needs forgiveness, and that's fine, but, um, but it's not something that I've really focused on. However, in the mental health community, sort of on the fringes, I think is fair to say, there are people who are, as I said, working on trying to understand moral injury and figuring out how do we help you know, people who want help, who need help. And so there was a, a couple of years ago, there was a moral injury repair group that was formed at the, um, the Naval Hospital in San Diego, Balboa Hospital, and it was part of, they have a huge PTSD program there, lots and lots of Marines and sailors in that program. And, you know, some of the people who were working there thought, you know, these guys don't have PTSD. You know, they're like Nick Ru Rudolph. They weren't terrified, but they're, you know, they're not okay. So let's shift them over and we'll call this the Moral Injury Repair Group, I think they called it. Doesn't exist anymore, it just, and, and I don't think it was completely authorized. Because when I looked on the hospital uh, organizational chart to try to find these, these guys, it, it wasn't, didn't exist, but I found them. Um, there was a therapist there working there by the name of Michael Castellana. And Michael Castellana, not a Marine, um, a very, very experienced trauma therapist. And he 
saw individual, so he was working at, Ca at Camp Pendleton uh, while this was going on and seeing individual Marines for therapy. But he also had a group. And so one day a Marine came to him, a big strapping Marine, uh, really angry. And um, he said, you know, Doc, I need your help. I need, I need your help. Something, you know, it's just, just terrible and it's wrecking my life. And Michael said, group. And the guy goes, no, no, I don't want to be part of a group. I, you know, I just want to talk to you. And Michael said, I think group would, you know, try it. I think you'll find it works. So the guy came to group. And in this group, there were Marines and sailors from different units. So they didn't know each other. So a lot of the, the first couple of weeks where they were meeting twice a week was just designed to build trust and make them feel at home and so that they can begin to talk about some of their experiences. And this Marine sergeant was like, Doc, I, I want to talk. And Michael said, not now, not yet. We're building, building this sense of community and trust. And it, finally, Michael said, OK, tomorrow's your time. You can talk tomorrow. So the next day, the Marine stood up. And he told this horrifying story about being in Iraq. And in a firefight, he killed two kids. And so right away, I thought, OK, it's like Nick Rudolph. This probably wasn't all that uncommon. But in this case, the kids he killed were about the ages of his brothers at home. And he felt like they looked like his brothers. And so he, he came away feeling like he had killed his brothers. And he was just overcome with shame and guilt and anger. And when he came back from, Afghan from Iraq, he couldn't, he couldn't go home. He didn't feel like he could go home because what if his father found out what he'd done? He, just, he couldn't face that. He would never be able to tell him. And so he just never went home. So he told the story in this group. <clears throat> and when he was done, Michael said, I want you to look around the room and tell me what you see. And the sergeant looked around the room and he was like, I don't see anything. And Michael said, see, that's, that's where your healing begins because people accepted your story and they're still here. They didn't flee in terror, they're still here. They still love you. They still accept you. So the end of that story is the Marine eventually went home, and he told his father what had happened. And his father hugged him and said, thank God I have my son back. So it was a good ending. So that's sort of what's happening with moral injury. And um, I want to, if you take anything away from this session here, um, I want you to think about ways that you might start a conversation with a veteran. Like I know, <laughs> I know from personal experience, this is, can be really awkward and um, difficult. Um, but I think if you approach it this way by saying, you know, I didn't go to Iraq or Afghanistan. I could never understand the kinds of things you went through. But if you want to talk about it, I'm really interested. I would really like to understand more of it. And so if you want to talk, I will listen. And, uh, and I'll listen hard. And I'll listen with validation. That's a term I learned from Michael Castellana, which is the same thing as, dude, that was fucked up, right? So, um, so if you can find ways, I think that this is how we break through uh, or avoid the problem that we had with the Vietnam generation. Because frankly, there's not enough Michael Castellanas in this world to help all the people who feel they're suffering from moral injury. There's just not enough of them. So it's really sort of up to us. And after all, we sent them there, right? So I kind of feel like we have an obligation to help get them home and you know, whole and happy and healthy. One other thing I want to say really quickly in this connection is that when we talk about sending people to war, when we talk about going to war, please try to remember that we're talking about, you know, the phrase is boots on the ground. I, I explode every time I hear somebody say, we should have boots on the ground, or we shouldn't have boots on the ground, or we might have a few boots on the ground. Please, it's, there's people in those boots. <laughs> you know, let's say American kids. Let's talk about sending or not sending American kids to war. So with that, Douglas, over Thanks to you. Thanks very much. Great, great summary of the book, great presentation.
So you, you talk about moral injury and how it's a, a constant that's experienced by almost those who engage in close combat. I think we need to stipulate you're really talking about people who engage in close combat, which is a very, very small percentage of those who actually go forward. Is that, you're shaking your head. Yeah, uh, yes, but, and I, and I just talked about people who were engaged in close combat. But um, the thing that became clear to me as I was thinking about and doing a reporting on moral injury is people who weren't in close combat also were susceptible to moral injury. For example, think about the uh, Air Force airmen who served at Dover Air Force Base never left New Jersey, right? But they, they received all the bodies of people coming back who had been killed in combat. You know, was there moral injury there? I'm sure. I am sure. Or think about, um, you know, I know two, well, I know a Special Forces pilot who I was interviewing on the phone a year ago, and uh, we were talking about something completely different. And right in the middle of, the, of him talking, he started to weep. And as it turned out, he was felt so guilty about the people he was killing on the ground who he never saw, but he knew he was killing them. And, and it, it just ate away at him. And he said, I don't know if I can continue. It's one of those, one of those interviews that goes this way and then that way. Um, but it, it really had a profound effect on me because I thought, you know, here's a guy who doesn't even see the people he's killing. He's very antiseptic, but boy, it did affect him. So, so the answer is, I, I'm not prepared to say that, that anybody who, well, let me turn, turn it around. I think everybody who goes to war or participates in war is vulnerable to moral injury of some kind or another. Okay. What separates, though, those who are really able to essentially deal with it on their own, who come back from the war and are fully functional and, and you know, may have, you know, may have the occasional thought or the occasional reminiscence or a day where they're depressed, but in essence have processed this and have dealt with it. Those who deal with moral injury and express fairly severe symptoms of it but are able to recover from it, and, and those who simply are not able to recover from it. What, did you see any commonalities in these groups? That's a really good question, and I think the mental health community is really grappling with that. What exactly is it that makes people more vulnerable than others to moral injury? Um, so I did some work about a year ago with the Special Forces community, and there, uh, you know, the focus is really on being self-directed and and self-confident, and I think that that has something to do with um, with being uh, with having the strength to absorb repeated moral blows without feeling like you've been injured. Although, you know, on the other hand, when I was reporting that story and really getting the sense that you know guys in special forces were sort of you know selected and trained and, and, and really developed to be immune to moral injury. When I was talking to doctors who served the Special Forces community, they were all, they brought up moral injury without me even mentioning it. And so I think it's a problem there also. And so the, I guess the short answer is, I don't think it's known what makes people more susceptible than others. Sorry, long answer, and I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> what were the, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase the question. What did you see as the, the, the real dangers of, of this moral injury to the individual? And again, who was able to, to work through it? Um, I almost thought of this as, you know, you know muscle damage. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes people have muscle damage and, you know, when we lift weights, we give ourselves muscle damage and then you come out stronger as a result of the, the muscle healing, regenerating, and you're therefore more resilient. Um, is that an accurate uh, metaphor for some people mm -hmm. for this? Um, you know, General Mattis talks about post-traumatic mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. um, and how those who have lived through this experiences are perhaps more resilient, um, more prepared, um, I suspect in his less political correct moments, General Mattis would say just better 
mm -hmm. um, for having experienced these things um, as opposed to those not. And, but again, um, you know, sometimes you lift too much weight and you tear the muscle, um, again, to carry the metaphor forward. So how can we, is that, a help, is that a helpful way in thinking about this? Is moral injury a strain that um, if you experience and successfully overcome, um, you have a more resilience, more uh, perhaps a better outlook, uh, more ex a, mm -hmm. a deeper experience base, mm -hmm. uh, more nuanced in a positive way, morality, um, or is, is this something that only has negative consequences? Well, I'm glad you brought that up, because I should have said at the outset that, um, that most of the people that I knew in Iraq and Afghanistan came home hugely strengthened by that experience. And, and proud of what they'd done, proud of what they'd been able to accomplish. You know, I talked about that um, uh, Marine lieutenant, you know, walking the perimeter in Vietnam, checking on his guys. And, you know, what a platoon sergeant has to accomplish to bring his guys home safe from a combat deployment, huge. And, you know, so there's a vast amount of pride among most of the veterans that I know about what they've accomplished. and personally and also, you know, the mission that they accomplished. Um, it's true that some people come back damaged, um, and maybe some of both. So I think what I've seen is the people who are, either have gotten help through a chaplain or a friend or however it happens, that, that as they process their moral injury, they become stronger. And, uh, for example, a chaplain who, who uh, went to Iraq, um, did I mention him? Can't remember if I did or not. But um, So there was a Navy chaplain who went to Iraq, really gung-ho, George W. Bush supporter and you know, proud that he was going to war. And when he got there, he was like, oh my Lord, you know, this is hor horrible and we should never allow this to happen. The, the, the suffering and destruction and death is just overwhelming. And, and after a couple of months, he was like, that's it, no God, God does not exist, and I'm, I'm a fool. Uh, pretty, severe, pretty severe moral injury. Finished out his deployment, came home, and, um, and then through a series of events which are too complicated to go into, rediscovered his faith and became very, very, um, a, a deeply, more deeply, I think, more deeply spiritual person. So, there are certainly those kinds of journeys that happen. Um, my other sense is that most people who experience moral injury, well, let me put it this way. You know, I talk to a lot of veterans and, um, who find out I'm writing, uh, I've written a book about moral injury. They're like, oh no, you know, here's the liberal media uh, beating up on uh, child killer soldiers. And I want, like, you know, accusing us of war crimes. And I, and I always say, no, it's worse than that. It's you accusing yourself of something you, that, that you feel, you know, uneasy about. And they're like, what do you mean? So I tell them a couple of stories from the book, and they're like, oh, I, I, that, that happened to me. Or, you know, I recognize that. That's, you know, that's, you know, I got that. And so from that, I, I guess I, I drew the understanding that there are people who, experience moral injury, and they're okay. And they don't even think about it. And that's fine, I don't have a problem with that. Where I come at this subject is that this is something that we have to deal with. Not necessarily that there's, I mean, certainly not that there's a whole population of damaged veterans wandering around out there, um, you, you know, as, as drug addicted, homeless, rapist, you know, the, you know, the stereotype, um, but that, we owe them something because they have suffered a moral injury. That's the point of the book. And, and that's where I get back to, um, you know, let's, let's listen to their stories. The, um, we'll, we'll, do, we'll get to the audience in a minute. Um, did you deal with the, the question of age in this, in this book at all? And I think of my, my own experience, you know, through accidents of, you know, historical events and army personnel policies. I didn't see close combat until I was 36. You know, I'd been married, I'd raised children, I'd fired people, I'd, you know, had to put people through judicial proceedings. I mean, I had a lot of life experiences to process this. And I'm not claiming I saw a lot of co close combat. You know, I was a 
fairly senior, and, and it was only a, through a few accidents. You know, apologies to Sergeants J.C. Callahan and, and Adam Dye. You were right. We were way too far forward. I was wrong. Um, but uh, it, only through a few, only a few. But nonetheless, um, I don't feel that those were particularly traumatic incidents for me. Again, because I was 36 years old. Um, and I had a deep experience base with which to, you know, I'd been to graduate school. I had lots of resources with which to <clears throat> process this. Um, your 19-year-old doesn't have that. Yeah. Um, is, is that part of this, that this is a burden that we largely place on young, relatively uneducated men? Well, it is, because most of the people we send to war are 19, 20, 21. Right. right. Um, and these are kids whose... Uh, ability to predict the, uh, the moral consequences of their actions, that part of their brain isn't fully developed, as any of you who have teenagers know pretty well. Um, and so we put into the most morally difficult and challenging situations people who are, by reason of age, are least able to deal with those moral complexities. So yes, I think, you know, that a large number of moral injuries fall on the youngest people we send to war. However, you know, Doug, I, I, I don't know if this is your experience or not, but the commanders, you know, Mike Mullen told me this. Um, you know, when I asked him about moral injury, he was like, yeah, tell me about it, you know, because he sent people into combat who were killed. And um, so, uh, you know, I think Maturity has a lot to do with being able to absorb moral blows and keep going, but I don't think you're immune to it no matter what your age. That, that's a good point. And certainly we know many generals who are, who are deeply burdened by the, the number of people who yeah. were casualties under their command. Yeah. Um, I guess with, with that, we'll, turn, we'll open this conversation to the audience. Um, a few housekeeping rules. Um, wait for me to call on you. Please wait for the microphone so those who are listening to this either live or will watch, it, or will watch it later uh, can hear what you have to say. Um, identify yourself, your name, and any relevant affiliation. And please, please, please make it a question. If you really think you have to make a statement, go write your own book and then I'll give you a full 90 minutes here on the stage. So um, ask a question. Um, this is not you know, a, a short preamble I will accept, but this is not the time to make a long uh, statement about how you feel about things. Please ask our author a question. He wrote the book. He deserves the questions. With that, we'll start with the gentleman in the uh, white sweater here. Uh, my name is John Gilman, uh, San Diego. I have worked with a number of veterans in uh, training programs, veterans who want to go into spiritual care and chaplaincy, some connected to the Naval Hospital there that you have mentioned. Mm. On page 217 of your book, you ask uh, Dundas a question, which I found really interesting, and you say about him that he was forced from the Corps for acting up after three deployments in Afghanistan. Your question to him is, why was being dismissed from the Corps a moral injury? Now, my question is, how elastic is the term moral injury? I'm interested in your perception on that would you apply a moral injury to this situation you know this person acting up being released from the court and then he says um you know he considers that to be a moral injury for himself so how elastic is that term somebody downsizes folks in an organization does moral injury apply to that so what is the, the scope uh, around the definition of moral injury well, it's elastic since I wrote the book and I get to, I get to define what a moral injury is. But in my experience, uh, one of the things that most deeply affects veterans is being separated from military service. So think about it. Uh, you know, you're 17 or 18 years old. You come in with a, you know, you're assigned to a group of, uh, uh, of Marines or soldiers or airmen, Navy guys. Um, and, and you become really tight with those guys, and when you go to war, you become even more tighter and more dependent on each other, and that develops into something that, um, you know, we sometimes call camaraderie, which I think is a stupid weasel word. I call it love. It's like total dedication to each other's welfare, and 
and, and getting that in return. It's a really, as you know, it's a very, very intense thing. You know, you come back, like Darren Doss, who was the Marine who I wrote about, um, came back and in two weeks was totally out of the Marine Corps. And, and the shock of suddenly losing all the people he loved and depended on was significant. And, and I think that's something that it, it's hard for us to, who haven't been in the military to understand and I didn't really understand it until I, I embedded with the Marine Battalion for a year once. And when it was over, and you know, we came, we, we came back from overseas and landed at Onslow Beach in North Carolina and walked off the thing and said goodbye. And I, I just, I almost burst into tears. I just felt this enormous loss. And that's a moral injury, that the grief and sorrow at losing the people you love most in the world, not to mention the fact that now you're in you know, some pretty difficult stuff and you don't have your guys around to help you or to commiserate or, you know. So yes, I think that can be a moral injury, absolutely. And it's one reason why, there's one other piece of it and that is people who go into the service serve. And the ideal, not always carried out every day, but the ideal is the nobility of service, right? Because it's selfless and you lose that when you get out of the service, it's gone. And all of a sudden you're in this sort of commercial helter-skelter world. And that can be hard. And that's one reason why so many veterans go back to service in some way, whether it's Team Red, White, or Blue, or Rubicon, or whatever, you know, but you find a lot of veterans going back looking for that meaningful service that they prize so highly. But so there is a sense of loss, I think, when you leave the service. And that's what I was talking about there. That doesn't matter whether you're kicked out or, or you know, you just serve your term and, and leave or retire after 20 or 30 years. I think it's the same. Yes, to continue to push you on, on you know, these number of variables and you know, what makes a difference, um, did you see a difference between those who, as you said, you know, come back from Afghanistan or Iraq and are out of the core of the Army two weeks later, and those who stay in the institution and kind of have a, you know, still surrounded by people, even if not the same people, um, you know, are in the institution that sent them there, so things are kind of more understood. Um, do you see a difference between those who stay in the institution after this traumatic experience and those who go back to you know, home, essentially, or, or some other place in the civilian world? Gee, Doug, you ask really good questions. I I'm glad you weren't my editor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back and think about that. Um, so I think the people who stay in service are still surrounded by that kind of support and that kind of work ethic and that kind of moral framework and that kind of um, nobility, you know. Uh, and that's really important. So I would guess that among people who stay in service, there are fewer instances of debilitating moral injury, but it's a guess. Um, I do know it's hard for people who leave, so uh, that's, I mean, that, that would be an interesting thing, an interesting research topic to find out. Um, but sadly, the money for research on moral injury is drying up. With the uh, lady here in the second row. <clears throat> it's been quite a while ago, but I'm I, sorry, your, your name, ma'am? Oh, but Patricia Ranch, I'm retired from the U.S. Foreign Service, and these things I come just to be informed, just to learn. Um, <clears throat> I remember it's been quite some time ago reading that there are soldiers in combat, not necessarily a firefight, but maybe this would apply also, but in combat that feels so strongly about what you've been talking about, this moral injury, although I don't remember it was defined as that at the time I'm thinking about, that they will deliberately miss a target. Now I'm wondering, are you aware of any studies that have been done on this, that that would be enough of a percentage to affect the outcome of a, a conflict? 
Wow, you're just opening up a whole new subject, which is fascinating. So the whole thing about killing, um, we do know from uh, clinical research that killing another human being imposes a mental burden on the killer. Um, there's a, a, a clinical researcher at the uh, San Francisco VA who's done a lot of groundbreaking work on this, and she has shown that people who have killed in combat have a much higher um, uh, risk of developing severe mental health problems later on in life. So there's that piece of it. Um, after World War II, SLA Marshall famously did a study of men in combat and came up with the finding that many people in direct combat chose either not to fire their weapon or to fire up in the air to avoid um, killing the enemy, even when they were at risk of being overrun. So since then, there's been a lot of doubt cast on his findings. They weren't really scientifically, rigorously done, and, and there's been a lot of controversy about that, whether that's true or not. I do know that the Marines of Charlie Company 1-6 told me that there were guys in the battalion who would do that in a firefight, wouldn't fire their weapon. Um, so it, it does happen. I, you know, I, I go back and forth on this. In, in, the, in the combat that I've seen, I never saw anybody not taking vigorous part. Um, but that's a pretty small sample, so, so I, I can't really say. But it, well, this, you know, SLA Marshall's book, Men Under Fire, was taken very, very seriously. Whether it was right or wrong, it yeah. was taken very seriously. Um, and it impacted the way that training was done. When, in, when men were sent off to the Second World War, they would shoot at you know big boxes essentially you know targets were put up and they were just rectangles and you would shoot at the rectangle. Um, Marshall said that didn't properly prepare you. Today you shoot at silhouettes that pop up that are man shaped that have a you know a body and a head on them um, that you know come up and come down and give the appearance of moving closer and closer to you to simulate the idea that no no I'm I'm shooting at a human being. Um, and the belief, although, again, we, we lack empirical data, uh, the belief is that that has conditioned people to get more used to the idea that you're shooting at people, not just a rectangle. Also, the weapons were redesigned. So World War II uh, rifle, very accurate. Uh, it was replaced by the M15, M16, sorry, which was more of an area spray weapon. And the feeling there, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was that you didn't have to be aiming at a specific person. Oh, Is that right? No, we still take one bullet, one person pretty seriously. OK. Um, <laughs> Sharon, my colleague. Sharon Burke with New America. So I have a question and then a comment maybe both of you could react to. On the question, did you look at all on you know, the so-called just war and whether that makes a difference? Because you were just talking about World War II. So my father-in-law is a combat veteran of World War II, and how he feels about his service is different, and I don't think that's strictly a personality <coughs> thing, um, and nor is it generational, because World War I, people came back very damaged as well. So I'm curious if you looked at that and if you see that that makes a difference. <clears throat> and then the comment was, when you said that, when you encouraged the audience to talk to people about their wartime experiences, I would say be careful, because like the conversation you were party to was how Marines talk to each other, and when a fellow Marine who was in combat with you says, that's fucked up, that's one thing. But when a civilian who wasn't says that, it's a really different thing. So I, not everybody wants to talk to someone who wasn't there um, or is able to. Because again, those guys that were there are going to have a different understanding. So I would say be careful about approaching people. Because um, sometimes it, it's, it actually feels insulting. Like, who'd you kill? Did you kill someone? It, so I'd say be careful, and maybe Doug has a comment about that too. Well, thank you. That's a that's a really good point. Um, the phrase that was fucked up really meant approach your listening project with with a sense of validation. In other words, not trying to to deny or denigrate the experience that the person had. You can validate it with silence. Just say, you know. 
what I'm getting at there is not to, not to, not to diminish the importance of what that story is. That's what I was getting to. Um, your first question, I'm sorry, where were you? Oh yeah, just war. So I spent a lot of time thinking about writing about reading about just war, and um, but I think the bottom line that I came to was for people in direct combat, just war is silly. It has no relevance to what they're doing. I don't think that it makes a great deal of difference. Um, you know, there's, uh, I drew this out in a book with a, with a story about a Marine who fired a, a rocket into a building and there were, the Taliban had herded men and women, women and children into that end of the building and a lot of them were killed. A and to that kid, you know, whether the war was just or not, that was a horrifying experience which he couldn't ever deal with. And, and so I came to think about just war as a fine theory for, you know, maybe later reflection, um, you know, is, is, are the things that I took part in justified in some way? Um, you know, I think that's a really personal thing. But in terms of the President of the United States saying this is a just war so you don't need to feel bad about anything that happens, uh, you know, I don't buy it. They don't buy it. I think it does, and, and that's one reason why I focus just on Iraq and Afghanistan, because I think they were different from a lot of the wars we fought in the past, and more morally ambiguous. And, uh, and again, um, you know, the people I know who came, who were in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan and who came back, you know, the way they feel about it personally and, and, and what they did or didn't do or saw or didn't see, um, they don't fit their experiences into a grander theory of was the war just or not. Yeah. 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 And I think that's the most important piece of this. Um, to study up for this, it's a, maybe a little rude to read from someone else's book, no, so one book reading. But uh, <laughs> I went back to Karl Marlenz's What It's Like to Go to War. Um, he says, um, of all the right things about my homecoming, it connected me with a group of women at Oxford whose ability to feel 